Later that night, I made my normal trip to the meditation room. I was used to getting greeted by the man's beaming smile, but tonight was different. He almost looked a bit solemn. I have come to grow fond of you, he spoke. They say attachment leads to suffering, but it is not to be avoided like a disease. It is within our suffering that we create meaning. He took a deep breath and continued. Your next journey in this hell will test you more than anything you have endured so far. It breaks even the strongest of minds. You will need help to get through it intact. I felt scared. I couldn't imagine it getting any worse than it already was. I was just getting used to being able to withstand the groups, and now it was going to get even harder. Well, when am I going to be able to escape here? I don't know if I can handle any more abuse. I responded in a somewhat aggressive tone, which I regretted. I knew this man or entity or whatever was only trying to help me and didn't deserve any malice. You are not ready to escape. When you are ready, you will know. I will assist you when I am able, but you must look for the signs. He spoke in his same peaceful tone. I sighed. At this point, this guy was the only thing that gave me any sort of hope. I really had to trust him. We began our nightly meditation, but this time it was difficult to get myself calm. I had racing thoughts about what horrible things would inevitably occur during the cocoon phase. Eventually, I heard that familiar ding of the singing bowl, and I opened my eyes to an empty area. I snuck out to my room, which at this point I had gotten really good at, and I lied down. The rest of the night was silent, and I fell asleep with ease. I woke up that morning covered in sweat. I must have had a nightmare, but I couldn't remember any details about it. My alarm clock hadn't gone off yet, so I just laid in bed for a little while. I was wondering what would happen to me during the cocoon phase. I even kind of laughed to myself purely out of the absurdity of my situation. Why the hell were these people getting off on torturing us? There must have been some insane reason. I reflected on Danny, and I grew bitter. What was that awful monster that pulled him through the crack in the air? It almost seems like the robed man's ritual summons that beast from a different dimension or something. After a bit more pondering, I heard my alarm clock go off, and I made my way to the dining hall for breakfast. I sat at a random table, with people I hadn't spoken a word to, ever, and we all ate silently. I scanned the dining hall, and I noticed that Travis and Alex were sitting at separate tables. They both had gotten large bags under their eyes, and they looked very frail and skinny. I wanted to help them. I had to at least convince one of them to meet the meditation men and start exercising with me. I decided that Travis would probably be the easiest to convince. I got up and sat in an empty chair next to him. Meet me at the start of the trail during free time. I didn't even wait for a response. I just got up and went back to my original table. Then, right as I finished my food, I heard a familiar voice. Group time. A large group of men in white gathered everyone in the cocoon phase and we all walked upstairs to the same row of locked doors that myself, Alex, Matt, and Travis had found a while back when we were exploring the grounds. There were around forty of us, including the men in white, so we hardly even fit in the long hallway. One of the men reached out into his pocket and pulled out a set of keys. He went to the far room and unlocked the door. Ten of you at a time. You know the drill he said. Five men in white ushered ten of my peers into the room, and five men in white stood behind us. I happened to be towards the middle of the group, so I didn't have to go in at first, but some of my peers had to be physically forced into the room. Some of them were even crying and shaking, 
but no one was pleading with them or begging them to stop. We stood restlessly in the hallway for a full hour until the door opened up again. First, the men in white walked out with wide grins on their faces, and then the patients came out. We all had to press up against the walls so they could pass. All of them walked slowly with their heads down, staring at the ground and not saying a word. I happened to see Alex as he passed me. His eyes were wide, and he had a terrified expression on his face. The same five men in white then escorted me and nine other patients into the room. I don't know exactly what I expected, but it certainly wasn't this. The room was huge, and only lit with a dim purple light. There were ten large pools filled with water on the ground, all of which were all right next to one another. Line up, one of the men in white yelled. Everyone quickly formed a line behind me. One of the men in white went to the corner of the room, where a bouquet of large purple and yellow flowers was sitting in a vase on a chair. He pulled one of the flowers out. Kneel down, he commanded me. I knew I could not do anything to stop him, so I complied with his demand. He then plucked a petal off and had me open my mouth, and he placed the petal on my tongue. It dissolved almost immediately, and another man in white came up behind me and blindfolded me. Next, he lifted me up like I weighed nothing and placed me into one of the pools. Lie down. I laid in the pool, and I found that I was floating. I suddenly knew what this was. This was some sort of sensory deprivation tank. As for the flowers, I had no idea, but I had actually been in a sensory deprivation tank before. Though they usually had a lid to prevent any light from getting in, this time I had a blindfold on. For a couple minutes, I really didn't know what the big deal was. I actually really enjoyed sensory deprivation tanks, and I didn't think lying in one for an hour would be that bad. Then the hallucinations started. At first, it wasn't too bad. I would see glowing geometric patterns, but they were all asymmetrical and out of place. If you've ever done DMT, it was similar to that, except the patterns were all out of place and were harsh colors. It began to burn my eyes. I was about to tear my blindfold off because it was hurting so badly when I found that I couldn't move my body. I started to panic. I couldn't even open my eyes in the blindfold. The pattern started getting more jagged, and it felt like they were piercing through my eyes. Eventually, my whole body felt like it was on fire. It kept hurting more and more. I thought I was going to die. I didn't know a human could experience so much pain without dying. It kept going and going until the patterns morphed into daggers of glowing light that jabbed into my eyes. I had to do something before I completely lost my mind. In a moment of clarity, I thought of the meditation man. I tried to focus on my breath, but it seemed impossible. I would get a couple of breaths in and then lose my focus because of the intense pain. After what felt like hours had passed, I felt someone grab my arm and drag me out. My blindfold was torn off, and I saw that it was one of the men in white. I still couldn't move, so I laid there while the men in white dragged everyone else out of their respective pools. He then physically opened my mouth and placed one of the yellow flower's petals on my tongue. Right away, I felt all my limbs come to life. I could move again. I slowly stood up, and the men in white threw us all towels to dry off. Then, he commanded us to exit the room. I walked slowly with my head down past my peers. I went to one of the lounge rooms and sat on a couch and cried until lunch. I then proceeded into the dining hall and got my food and sat down at a random table in the cocoon section again. I didn't even look to see who was sitting with me. I just stared at my food. I tried to eat, but my hand was shaking so badly I could hardly get the food to my mouth. 
After lunch, I rushed down to the sauna. I prayed that Travis would come to meet me. I didn't want to be alone in this. I wanted someone to escape with, and I knew it had to be soon. After about twenty minutes, Travis showed up and sat down next to me. You're right, man. You're right. We have to get out of here. He started crying. I awkwardly tried to comfort him by putting my hand on his back. We can do this. Just listen to me. I found someone who was willing to help us. It's going to sound weird, but the first thing you need to do is start exercising. Use the gym or run around the trail. It'll help. Tonight, I'll sneak out right at 3 a.m. and come into my room. Do not knock or anything. Just come right in. I left it like that and walked away out of the sauna, leaving Travis with his thoughts. Next, I went to one of the lounge areas and sat on one of the couches. Right as I was starting to get comfortable, I hear, Next group. I couldn't do it. I couldn't handle another group like that. I would have rather killed myself. I didn't get up with my peers. I just kept sitting while everyone else was being brought to the next group. A minute passed, and I actually thought for a second they were going to leave me be, when I felt someone yank me by my hair off of the couch. He started dragging me by my hair, and then dropped me on the ground. Get up. It's group time. He laughed at me. I followed him upstairs to another one of the rooms with locked doors. Another man in white brought out his keys and opened three of the doors on the opposite side of the hall. He then separated us into groups of ten, and a man in white led each group into one of the rooms. My group happens to have both Alex and Travis in it. In the room was another robed man and a bunch of what looked like dentist chairs. I couldn't quite make out what the robed man looked like, because this room was also only lit with a dim purple light. He then had all of us lie in the chairs while he placed a cap on our heads that had multiple cords coming out. The cords were long and went into the walls. The robed man advanced to the center of the room and started reading from a huge ancient looking book. I have no idea what he said. It was all in some strange language. But after a minute, I felt my eyes grow heavy and I started to drift off to sleep. I started having memories of my best friends when we were kids. We were playing this game we made up called Hide and Go Seek. The way it was played was that one person was a guard. He had an airsoft gun, which are basically weaker BB guns that only stung a bit when you got shot from a distance. The rest of the people playing were assassins. They would hide and try to sneak up and fake stab the guard with the airsoft gun. I was the guard this time and we were playing at my friend Tom's house. As I was walking around, my friend Craig popped out of the corner and fake stabbed me. I got you, he yelled gleefully. No, that doesn't count. I saw you go inside. That's off limits, I responded. No, I didn't. I didn't lie. I got you. I won. He kept rubbing it in my face, and I felt myself getting more and more angry. Screw you, I said. Don't be so mad that you suck at this game so bad. All of a sudden, I felt my rage boil over, and I tackled him to the ground and started beating him with my airsoft gun. Stop! Please stop! He screamed. But it just made me go harder. My only friends tried to get me off of him, but it was too late. I jammed the airsoft gun into his eye and pulled the trigger. Now, from point-blank range, the airsoft gun can do some damage. And when I shot him, he went blind in that eye for the rest of his life. My other friends were yelling at me. Tom called for his mom, and she called 911. I just sat outside of their driveway until my parents came and got me. I had to go to a kid's psychiatric unit for my outburst, and I lost all of those friends. Except none of that happened. I mean, me and my friends used to play hide-and-go-seek, but I never beat my friend and shot his eye. Or did I? 
I couldn't recall that moment correctly anymore. For all I knew, I actually did beat up Craig and blind him in one eye. I don't remember what actually happened. Then, suddenly, I awoke. A man in white pulled off the cap on my head, and we were again told to leave the room. During free time, I went up to my room. I sat on my bed and tried to recollect what actually happened that day with my friends, but all I could see was me beating Craig senseless. It all seemed so real. They must have messed with my memories somehow. I would have never beat my friend like that. But the more I thought about it, the more I believed that it actually happened. I lied down and tried to take my mind off of that event when I saw a black videotape on my nightstand that I didn't notice before. No, I didn't have a TV in my room, let alone a VCR. I knew that some of the group rooms had TVs, but who even used VCR nowadays? I grabbed the tape and went downstairs. I knew the rules stated that I had to watch this tape, but I wasn't even sure I could trust the rules anymore. They did lead me to the meditation man, though, so I decided that it would probably benefit me to watch it. I went to one of the group rooms, and it actually did contain a VCR. I looked outside the door to check if anyone was around, and it was all clear. I guessed that everyone was probably either in their rooms, out on the trail, or in one of the lounge areas during free time. No one wanted to be in any of the group rooms when they didn't have to be. I turned on the old television and put the tape in the VCR. The first thing that flashed on the screen was an image of a naked, incredibly pale man with long arms and legs. He was in a forest, and he looked like he was searching for something frantically. Immediately, the screen cut to maggots all over a dead body, and then quickly cut to a basement. It was kind of hard to see because it was so dark, but I could make out three children who were sitting and tied to a support beam. They weren't moving or talking. The middle child started opening his mouth. It kept opening more and more until I heard a crack, and then the screen switched to an image of a yellow door. It stayed on the door for about a minute, until a man in a suit entered the frame and painted the numbers 117 on it in black, and then painted a snake below it. Was this a sign? The rule stated to never enter room 117, but how did this tape know that my favorite animal was a snake? It could have maybe been a coincidence. I didn't have long to think about it when the screen flashed to a black and white image of a lighthouse. The waves were crashing over the rocks, and giant tentacles started to come out of the water and wrap around the lighthouse. Then, it switched to a video of a woman with black hair covering her face. She was rocking back and forth in a rocking chair in the corner of an old, dilapidated room. She gradually raised her hand and pointed at me. There was a loud scream and then the screen went black. The scream scared the hell out of me, and I jumped. That was it. The tape didn't really do anything to me, but creeped me out a bit. I wondered if the man painting on the yellow door was one of those signs the meditation man notified me about. I took the tape out and threw it in the trash. I checked the time on the clock, and it was already dinner time. After dinner, we didn't have any more groups. I guess in cocoon phase, we only had the torture of the sensory deprivation tanks and the memory altercations. But these groups were hundreds of times worse than what we were experiencing in the caterpillar phase. I tried to get Travis's attention, but he wouldn't talk to me. The only thing he said was, he'll see me at 3 a.m. I went to my room and decided to see if I could fall asleep while I waited. I set my alarm for 2.55, and I actually ended up dozing off pretty swiftly. I woke up, and it was pitch black. The first thing I noticed was that I was not, in fact, in my room, and also that I was lying on cement. I suddenly became fearful. Where the hell was I? I felt around and came upon a flashlight. Well, I was lucky. 
I thought. I was about to turn it on when I heard a child giggling. This certainly freaked me out, but it also reminded me of the rules. You may wake up in the basement with no recollection of how you got there. Do not shine a light. You will have to feel your way out. I had to get out of here. I needed to show Travis the meditation man. It was almost like Harmony Hills itself was trying to prevent me from bringing Travis to the meditation room with me, so I knew that I really had to do it. I smashed the flashlight on the ground and stood up. I slowly crept forward, keeping my hands in front of me so I wouldn't run into anything. As I was walking, I kept hearing children giggling and running off. At one point, I yelled at them. Would you shut the hell up? Don't use naughty words, mister. They responded. It caught me off guard a bit. Was there actually a child down here? There's no way. Um, are you okay? Do you need help or something? No, mister. You're the one who needs help. It giggled and then ran off. I shuddered. I quickly remembered that I broke part of the rule. I interacted with something in the basement. I tried not to think about it and kept going. After a couple more steps, I felt something breathe on the back of my neck. It was freezing cold and smelled rancid, like a dumpster with spoiled food in it. I shut my eyes and kept moving forward. I eventually ran into a wall, so I turned to my left and kept going. It seemed to go on forever. I would go straight for a while, and then hit a wall. Then I would alternate between left and right turns. I knew I couldn't stop. I could hear and feel the thing that was breathing behind me, and I didn't want to agitate it. The creature imitating a child was always ahead of me. It kept telling me to turn around and to meet their daddy. I started to slowly jog with my hands stretched out in front of me. I probably would have looked ridiculous in the light, but I certainly didn't stop to worry about that. Suddenly, I tripped and fell onto the stairs. I started sprinting up them as fast as I could. I made it to the top of the stairs, and there was the door. I turned the knob when something grabbed my leg and started dragging me down the stairs. My face hit one of the steps hard, and I felt blood running down my face. Daddy's gonna eat you. I heard the child squealing with delight. I wasn't going to die down here. I pulled my other leg back and kicked as hard as I could. I felt my foot hit something and the grip loosened on my leg. I tore away and ran up the stairs with my hands and feet. I opened the door and crashed onto the ground. I woke up on my bed. It was 2.48 a.m. My face was aching, and I felt exhausted. I turned off my alarm and waited until 3 a.m. It was 3.04 when Travis came. He actually really startled me, even though I knew he was coming. I guess I was still on edge from the whole basement experience. Dude, you look like hell. What happened to your face? He asked. I ignored him. Let's go. Now. Follow me and stay quiet. We don't have much time. It was slightly more difficult to sneak around the men in white with Travis, but we were still able to do it. Once we got to the meditation room, the man was waiting for us. I was beginning to think I had lost you, my friend. He smiled, and it actually made me smile a bit too. Travis wasn't as amused. Tell me how to get out of here, right now. His response surprised me. I never even thought of demanding the meditation man around like that. He was so peaceful and friendly. Ah, yes. You're a lion. A fighter. You must relax. Sit and breathe with us. Your time for escape will come if you allow it. He answered. I don't have time. I need to get out of here now. 
You're gonna tell me, or I'm gonna make you. Travis lunged at the meditation man. He had his hand cocked back, ready for a punch, and he threw himself right through the meditation man and onto the floor. Yes, he literally traveled right through the meditation man, like he was a ghost. The man laughed. Violence will not get you anywhere here. Sit with us. Calm your mind. The room fell silent for a second, until I stuttered out. What are you? He smiled widely, and said, Just a friend. Travis calmed down, and we ended up sitting with the meditation man until the singing bell went off, and he was gone. Somehow, when we sat with him, it was almost like he was able to stretch time around us. I knew we only sat there for around five minutes, but those five minutes lasted much longer than normal. I also ended up asking him if he sent me a sign in the videotape, but he responded, if you felt there was a sign, then there was. I should have known I wasn't going to get any clear-cut answers from him, but I thought it was worth asking about. After the meditation, I actually saw Travis smile for the first time since detox. He thanked me for bringing him, right before we quietly snuck our way back to our rooms. The next few days were horrible. The groups didn't get any easier, but Travis did start accompanying me on my meditation visits, and he also started exercising with me. I think Alex even started to notice that we looked slightly less sullen than the other patients, and I was hoping we would be able to get him to join us. But as one good thing would come, my hope would get torn away. That's how it was for me at Harmony Hills. It was maybe day ten since I started the cocoon phase, and though the groups didn't get any easier, our meditations and exercises gave us some reprieve. I was sometimes able to differentiate between the false memories that they implanted in me, but I decided that I would worry about that later. First, I had to escape. That day, Travis and I were running on the trail during free time. We were about halfway done, when another patient named Drew was walking towards us from the other direction. He stopped us from running and told us to follow him. We walked around twenty feet away from any other person, and he pulled out a little baggie with brown powder in it. Dude, I found this tucked away in my bag. Can you believe it? He said. Is that what I think it is? Travis asked. Yes, sir, it is. This is some grade-A heroin right here. I literally just found it in my bags. I got it from this drug dealer I knew back at home. I can't believe I found it. You guys can do something with me, because I love you so much. He laughed. I saw Travis's eyes get wide, and he looked at me. Now I knew the rules stated to never do any drugs that you're offered here. But since he literally just found this stuff in his bag and he knew where it was from, I thought that it would be okay. That was a mistake I will never forgive myself for. Before I even knew what I was saying, I blurted out. I know where we can do this. Follow me. We were giggling like we were kids on Christmas as we made our way to the sauna. We got there and sat down. Drew poured out a small bit of the brown powder, and used a piece of paper to form it into a line. Make sure you don't do too much, man, I told Drew. I know, I know. I'm starting with this tiny bit, but look how much I have. This is so good, it'll last all of us at least a week. He then rolled up the paper and snorted the line. He laid back and audibly sighed. Oh, man, that is so nice. Before I could think, Travis had already formed his line and had his head down ready to snort the powder. He did it and had the same reaction as Drew. Both of the reactions were exactly how people normally behave when doing H. So I grabbed the baggie 
and formed my own little line. I went down to snort it, but then I hesitated. I looked up at Drew and saw he had a nosebleed. Uh, hey, man, are you okay? I asked. He didn't respond. I looked at Travis, and his nose was bleeding too. I thought maybe I shouldn't do this, when Drew's skin literally began bubbling like a pot of boiling water. I screamed. Your skin! Dude, your skin! Yeah, man, that's good. He stated. Then Travis's skin began bubbling. It started at their arms until eventually all of their skin was bubbling. They didn't even seem to notice what was happening. They were both still nodding out on the heroin, acting like they were in complete blissful ignorance to what was going on. I knew I couldn't get anyone to help. So I just sat there, frozen in horror, as I watched their skin bubble and then start to melt off to the bone. I snapped out of it and ran out of the sauna into my room. I cried and cried. My friend was dead, and I could have stopped it. I stayed in my room for the rest of the day until the night came along. I was in a sort of awake but coma-like state. I couldn't cry anymore, but I couldn't move my body. After a little while, I heard a light knocking at my door. Anthony? It's Travis. Dude, why'd you run off like that? I shot out of bed and ran to the door. I stopped right before I put my hand on the door handle. If it's really Travis, then just come in. You don't need me to open the door for you. I heard a chilling giggle. Your friend is dead. Your friend is dead. It sang as it sauntered off. Go to hell, you monster! I screamed. I walked back to my bed and decided right then that I would get some answers out of the meditation man. 3 a.m. came along and I rushed to the meditation room. I actually almost got caught from making too much noise, but I didn't even care. I was going to go out fighting if they did catch me. Luckily, I made it there without any incident. The meditation man was sitting with seemingly no expression on his face. He looked at me and beckoned me to sit. No, I asserted. You're going to give me some answers right now. He thought for a second with that same neutral expression. Yes, I have an answer for you, but you will not like it. Tell me, I said. You must get yourself put into the box. If you are violent with them, they will kill you. But you must break their rules. Just nothing too drastic. Why the hell would I want to get put into the box? I asked. Because they will soon replace your true memories of this place with new ones. And soon after that, you will be lost in this hell forever. Or killed. If you are in the box when this happens, it will give you some time. I thought for a second. I saw a few patients that came back from the box. All of them were completely mute after their experience. They never spoke to anyone again, and they basically acted brain dead. Their eyes were vacant, and they just did whatever the men in whites told them to do. I'll do it, I declared. All right, my friend. Then let me teach you a breathing technique that may aid you during your time in the box. It is called Breath of Fire. Breath of Fire was done by pumping from the center of my navel while breathing rapidly from my nose. It took me a few days to master it. The meditation man kept telling me I was doing it wrong and then explained it over and over again. He would say, no, be more forceful with your exhale, or you must feel the air enter your nose. Do not think, only do. 
Over those next few days, I kept going into their sensory deprivation tank and eating the hallucinogenic flower petal and having terrifying and painful trips. Many of my memories with my family were also replaced. I even tried to write down as many things as I could about my family, about how I loved them, and about my favorite experiences with them. But even the writing would somehow change itself to fit the new memories. The new memories were the worst part. Even worse than the sensory deprivation tank. I had fake memories of me berating and hitting my mom. I had memories of me abusing animals and of burning my dad's house down. I even had some where I beat up homeless people and stole what little they had. One night, the meditation man told me I was ready. You must do it now, he said, and then he disappeared. My heart was beating in my chest. I knew what I had to do. I decided the easiest way to get put into the box would be letting them catch me sneaking around at night. So all I had to do was leave the meditation room and make a bunch of noise. I didn't want them to get suspicious, so I snuck back up to my room, then walked out and slammed the door and started screaming. I'll kill you. I'll kill you all. Immediately, men in white shot up the stairs, and one came from behind. I put up enough of a struggle to make it realistic, but not to actually hurt one of them. Two of them had me by the arms and legs, and two were by my side, as they carried me outside. I kept struggling while all the men were smiling. Have fun, kid. We're bringing you to the box now. One of them laughed. I almost let out a grin. Yeah, well that's exactly what I want you to do, you psycho. I thought. They carried me outside and started making their way towards the detox center. One of the men opened one of the steel cellar doors at the base of the detox, and we made our way down the cement stairs. I started fake, pleading with them. Wait, please, I'm sorry, don't put me down there. Too late now, the man holding my arms said. One of the men in white pulled out a set of keys. I could only tell because of the sound. It was pitch black down there. I briefly thought of my experience in the basement, and I hoped things would go smoother than that. They opened the door, jammed me inside, and then shut and locked it. The box ended up being a 4x4 four four foot square room. It was clearly too small to stand or lie in, but I could sit just fine. Bright, harsh lights came on. They were similar to the lights at a supermarket or Walmart. I saw that the walls and ceilings were completely made of mirrors. I almost lost myself in the reflections until I shut my eyes. I wasn't going to let any of this get into my psyche. After a few minutes, the noises started. They were blasting the room full of horrible sounds. First, it sounded like nails on a chalkboard. Then it would sound like this strange, static noise. Eventually, it just cut to a man's voice. He sounded like an announcer at a sports game, talking through a cheap microphone. All he would say was, Number one, you are number one. And then, Number two, you are number two. And he would go on for hours and hours, until he reached a random number. Then, randomly, the static and nails on a chalkboard sounds would crash through my ears again. I made sure to never open my eyes, because I knew that once I did, I would be lost forever. I tried shutting my ears with one hand, but it somehow did nothing to dampen the sounds. So I sat, with my hands resting on my knees. The first hour, I was panicked but eventually I found my breath within the chaos. Every time an intrusive thought came along, I would breathe fire, and it would calm me down a bit more. It was at a point where I wasn't even paying any attention to anything. I felt myself float in the cosmos, just like I did when I meditated with the meditation man. A smile grew on my face. 
All of a sudden, I heard the lock outside jiggle, and the door swung open. I was very confused. I felt like I had only been there 24 hours max, and they were already coming to get me. A man in white grabbed my leg and dragged me back out into the world. He looked at me in the eyes, and there was visible disappointment on his face. How this will make it out so intact? He asked one of the other men in white. I'm really not sure. Let's bring him to the owner. Oh Christ, I really didn't want to see this guy again. They brought me back into the main building and up the stairs to the owner's room. One of the men in white went in first, and they talked for a couple minutes, but I couldn't hear what they were saying. The door opened, and the man smiled at me. Your turn, he said. I stepped into the room with my eyes glued to the floor. I wasn't going to make the mistake of looking the owner in the eyes again. How did you make it through the box? he asked. I didn't respond. Ah, you're going to stay silent with me. Well, will you at least look at me? I felt my neck tense up. It was like something was trying to force my head up, but I kept it still. The owner let out one of his booming laughs. Fine, fine. But it does not matter. From now on, you will never be alone. No. Leave me. He was right. From then on, there was a man in white with me everywhere I went. When I slept, when I went to the bathroom, and when I ate, there was a man in white accompanying me. I started to get nervous. I couldn't sneak out and see the meditation man if someone was always watching me. I knew I had to make a move, but I didn't know what to do. The only thing I could think of was the sign I interpreted from the videotape. The man painted the number 117 with a snake below it. I guess I had to go into room 117.